uh, I dare say you, uh, you, you behave like a good class. It seems that you uh, uh, have managed to, to find your seats and we are, we are ready to uh, have the next half an hour with uh, uh, questions. And uh, I believe it's very important that, that your questions have the highest priority. So uh, I'll open the floor so you can uh, raise a finger or something and then we have microphones that will be circulating. Uh, and I'll try to, to, the best I can, to, to, to keep an order in this, and I'll maintain order in this room uh, brutally and unfair. Uh, so uh, that's the way to go about it. Uh, Dore? Thank you. Uh, yes, it's working. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Dore Lange. I'm the vice president of the Danish Teachers Union. And, uh, and Andreas, of course, what makes, makes us a bit uneasy here is your pointing out of the big classes, the big class sizes, and, the, and that the teachers around the world uh, are very pleased, although they have big class sizes. And uh, I must tell you, I went, I went to Singapore with some of the, actually with some of the people here in the room as well, uh, some years ago, and, uh, and what the teachers told us in Singapore was, the first thing they almost said to me was, oh, we would so like to have the smaller class sizes that you have in Denmark. And, uh, and of course, that is, that is what teachers would like, to have small class sizes. But, but I, I understand what your advice is on in this presentation is that given you have the same amount of money, then you should rather use it for teachers not having to teach so many lessons and then have more time outside the classroom in order to qualify your teaching. And uh, so, so the point that I would like to make is that maybe you should invest a little more and then you can have both. But looking at the Danish um, way of organizing schools today, then what would your recommendation be? I hope you won't say class sizes of 50 students, but, but, the, but on, on the aspect of, teach, of what teachers should spend their time on. You know, I, I would just say that uh, in Denmark, you do pay a quite high price for the small classes, given you know, average expenditure, in terms of giving teachers very little time for other things than teaching that actually are very important. Time with individual students, time with other teachers, time in engagement in research. You see, if you has, had asked the Singaporean teachers, not do you like a smaller class, but are you prepared to give up you know, some of your 100 hours for research to have a smaller class? Or you know, are you going to prepare to give up you know, participation in a professional learning community in order to have a smaller class? You might have got a different answer. And I think it's about you can spend each krona only once. And it, I, would, I would really say, in the case of Denmark, you have ended up with giving teachers a lot less for you know, professional growth and also for collaboration than what you'd really need to have a profession that owns its practice. No? Uh, thank you. And we have a question in the middle here. Uh, yeah, uh, Steen Nebelarsen, associate professor, this place, and critic for the Danish newspaper Information, where I reviewed your book, uh, Fundamental Education, or maybe not your book, but you wrote the preface to that. Um, I have three small questions for you. One is, how does it come that you are blindfolding yourself to um, the economic structures out there? Because they are sorting out among companies, uh, the winner takes all, and so, and so we have competition out there in society, and that kind of gets reflected in the educational system. That's why educational system is always Sort of sorting out people and giving high priority to people with good marks and so on. That's a part of the whole structural embeddedness of educational system in capitalism. So how can you not talk about structures and economy out there that's kind of being reflected in the educational system and only blaming the educational system itself from inside? Uh, the other question is, when people do not have an idea of having a future in sciences, First of all, so we must discuss what is sciences, is that also humanities and art? But it could be that young students will think, due to the structural development of the future in this society, I will have no job in architecture because people get fired uh, if the architecture company is not 
good in competing. So they are also answering in a way that's also a kind of an anticipation of the, whether or not they have a chance to get a job, whether or not they can survive in this structural setting of architectural brands in competitive capitalism. And that means that it's not only what they can estimate or hope they will dream for, it's only a kind of a contextual analysis of the world in which we're living. And I think that you are kind of forgetting about the contextual world around uh, OECD idealism in a way. Uh, the third question goes like that. I think you have this idea that a curriculum based or a kind of a knowledge based start point is like that knowledge that's being transmitted to or through going through transmission to other people. And I think that's a completely failure because in order to have meta learning that you are propagating also in OECD 2030 as a new competence, new skill, you have to have solid knowledge of reading classics, uh, being knowing about things, and so. And that's not a dead knowledge. In the German concept of Bildung, you would think that uh, uh, refining your critical judgment, kritische Urteilskraft, would be something that you learn in the midst of knowledge and deep, profound knowledge of subjects. So how does it come that OECD is kind of um, stating that this first part, this knowledge space curriculum is only dead knowledge. I don't really understand that. And we cannot have machines to give us that, as you also are writing in your preface to this four dimensional education book. We have to be able to have high knowledge, profound wisdom of subjects, and not to let that down. Yeah. Uh, thank you. On the um, outside world, you're absolutely right. We need to see education in context, but I also think we need to look at the reverse. How does the school of today shape society of tomorrow? And I do think this is something that, you know, you can ask this about the economy, you can ask about the culture, to what extent is, you know, culture inherited from the past, you know, an immutable and outside constraint. So to what extent is culture created by what we do in education? I do believe that we have many tools in education to shape, actively shape tomorrow's society, tomorrow's economy. And uh, I do think that is the responsibility of education systems and the design curricula to think about what society would we want to live in. You know, irrespective of any constraints that are placed upon this, I agree. You know, there are lots of things that, that, uh, and the same for young people. You know, uh, yeah, I can look at the world of today and say, well, I wouldn't have any chance in this occupation, or I can give young people, you know, dreams that actually they can change that future and shape that future. And uh, actually, when we work on our 2030 project, the people who impress me most about this are the students themselves. Actually, uh, when we talked about the student curriculum, those were the groups that had actually the far furthest reaching vision about the future. It didn't come from the educators, it didn't come from the policymakers. So I think, you know, that is for me a very important mission for education to give young people, you know, to not to accept the status quo, but to give them the tools to question the status quo and shape it. And I, you know, I'm an optimist in that sense, and I think we have uh, seen that happening. On the last question, I have a very clear view. You know, I didn't say that we don't need knowledge. What I said is that we need to shift from content knowledge towards epistemic knowledge and understanding. Um, you know, can you think like a mathematician as opposed to remembering formulas and equations? Uh, and uh, you know, why do you teach so much trigonometry? in Denmark. You know, you cannot find the answer in today's world, surely not in tomorrow's. You find the answer in the world 200, 300 years ago when we needed those kinds of skills to measure the size of the fields. You cannot make an, any argument that trigonometry is an essential part of mathematics. It is not. I studied mathematics. Those of you who studied mathematics will know that that has nothing to do with the conceptual foundations of mathematics. Those are the ones that you would want to teach your students. Can you think like a mathematician? Do you know the foundations of mathematics so that you can build your knowledge base throughout life as opposed to learning isolated facets that had an instrumental value sometime in the past? And that's what we're doing. We do the same in history. You know, we teach people names and places rather than to teach them to think like an historian. And in today's world, I think it's the conceptual foundations of a discipline that really matter. Let me give you a very practical example. 
you know, in 2009, in the middle of the financial crisis, everybody said, well, you know, these days students need to be financially literate. Now, that's the skill of the 21st century. And so we said, okay, let's include that in the measurement of PISA. We make a little addition, financial literacy. And then the expectation was, you know, those countries who teach financial literacy will be uh, uh, better on the financial literacy test. We did not find any relationship between the prevalence of financial education and financial literacy. Who came out on top of the financial literacy test? Shanghai and China. The students had never heard about financial education, but they understood the foundations of what is behind it. They, they knew the concept of a risk. They knew the concept of a you know, mathematical relationship, and they could extrapolate from there to use that knowledge in a novel situation. That's the education of tomorrow, not to teach people the content and surface knowledge of today. Most of our curricula have become a mile wide, but they are an inch deep when you actually probe very deeply, and I think that's what I meant. You know, I'm not arguing against knowledge. I argue against a sort of kind of surface knowledge that is just very instrumental because you can solve a particular problem of today. And in my view, the fundamental in the industrial age, instrumental knowledge was the thing to do. You teach people once for their lifetime, you teach them the tools and tricks to do something. Today, that for me is that knowledge. It is about you know, understanding how the world works. It's looking behind the disciplines, seeing, looking at problems through dis different disciplinary lenses that is a success. At least that's what the conclusion we draw in the 2030 project. Uh, thank you very much. We have a question up front here. And there's one in the back. Hans Christian Christensen, I'm, I'm um, working at the AP Müller Foundation. We have supported a lot of initiatives in the Danish uh, public schools aiming at strengthening teamwork, improving collaborative culture and network, that part of uh, your presentation, so to speak. And yeah, the good thing is that I can testify that, that the ambition to improve on that dimension is really there and, and a lot of work is being done. Um, at the same time, I'm of course curious to know if you can tell anything more about um, countries that succeed on these dimensions. Have they done something particular? Do they have some, do they, <laughs> is that a particular part of the world or, or what? Could you give some advice or some, some, some inspiration? Uh, on that? Yeah, you know, in, in, in our experience, collaboration works when it's an integral part of the work organization. It's very hard to sort of add to the, from the outside to a school system. It needs to have an intrinsic value for, for teacher practice. You know, for example, if you look at the um, Japanese course of integrated study, it's basically a project-based collaborative enterprise. You couldn't teach that as a teacher if you wouldn't work with teachers from other disciplines around those things. So it's an integral part of this. And then you know what they do is they do very systematic lesson study where you would observe the lessons from, an, from other teachers every week. You analyze them. Uh, it's sort of an integral part of the entire work organization where basically the expectation on teachers is not just be there to transmit knowledge but to create knowledge. You are basically the designer of the instructional system as opposed to kind of conveyor of its components. And I think that's what makes collaborati collaboration effective. You can see that Finland and in, in Europe uh, would be a good example as well, as well, where there is a higher degree of, of teacher collaboration. Um, but it's, in my view, very hard to sort of bring into schools if you don't fundamentally change the kind of way in which work is organized. No. Uh, and we had one in the back of the room and uh, later in the middle. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Karen Bjorn Peterson. I'm an associate professor here at the Department of Education. I have two questions to you. Uh, I've been both to Japan, I've seen the schools there, how they collaborate in Hong Kong and Singapore, in the United States and a lot of other places where I have observed schools. Uh, the, one, the first question is uh, regarding Shanghai and the Chinese kind of 
example. Uh, I understand that you are very much impressed by the Chinese situation. However, I would like to ask you, we know, I know that from colleagues in Hong Kong as well, that they presume that some of the schools that have been chosen for the Chinese OECD are kind of chosen. This means that we don't see how the schools in the outskirts of China are doing. So some discussions around that. Uh, so that's the first one. The second question, which I see all over the world now, is that you, OECD, has an important, I think our, our uh, department leader told that, you have an extremely big impact on education policy all over the world. So how do you see, and many critics, for example, you may know David Berliner in the United States, for example, many of those critics will say the reason that our education system failed a bit is that we have the implications from the OECD wanting us to do curriculum, wanting us to have teaching to the test, because this is what we are testing, and this is what we are measured up around. So lots of the alternative approaches, for example, in the United States say, now we are going away from that. You may know the P-TECH schools, totally different approach, probably what you also would encourage. But how is it, how does it come that in a way the OECD impacts will, I think, rather problematic um, influences on the national curricula? So the role of yourself on the education, did you ever study that? Yeah, the first question is easy to answer. You know the sample in uh, Shanghai in China is drawn on the same criteria that the sample in Denmark is drawn. It's basically composed from a whole list that the OECD picks the schools and then we test them. So uh, it is fairly representative. Also, you know, honestly, there would be no incentive for a country when they do this for the first time to look better than they are because that would mean that then they, would, they do it the next time, they would look worse. You know, actually, for policymakers are very keen to see improvement wherever they are. So I don't think any country has a, any incentive to distort the, the results. And we have no evidence for that, actually. We have looked at this very carefully. On the influence of the OECD, I mean, all what we do is we provide a mirror in which people can see themselves. You know, we provide comparative data. Uh, the one country where I don't think the OECD had any influence on the curriculum is the United States, because there is no curriculum in the United States. Basically, it's very localized. And I also don't think the United States is a country that actually is listening very much to what happens in other education systems anywhere in the world. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, my own country would be an example that has actually listened very closely to the PISA results. The results came out in 2000 for the first time. And educators were quite shocked by this, not by the overall mediocre performance, but by the very large social disparities in the school system. You know, the, the Germany came out as a country where social impact made a lot more of a difference than it did in other countries. And the country did something about it. It improved, you know, the learning time in schools. It improved the education of children with an immigrant background. And it's seen massive, massive improvements on this. So that, for me, is a, is a really good example where a country has seen how the world works, that other countries do better, that the country itself can do better, and it has learned important lessons from, from the world. That's, I think, all you can take away from, from PISA. PISA doesn't you know, specify much in the curriculum. In fact, you know, what we would argue that most tests that are used across countries do almost the opposite than what you know uh, the PISA results would suggest. Uh, many of the tests that we use are actually very superficial in terms of you know multiple choice tasks on content. That's not you know teaching towards that kind of thing is not going to improve your PISA performance. No. And um, PISA doesn't test 
things that you can teach very quickly and very easily. Now, conceptual understanding, epistemic understanding are things that are about you know, good instruction, not about anything that you can, in a way the kind of content sensitivity of PISA is very low, you know, teaching very specific content doesn't get you much of an advantage. So, you know, I think different countries have taken different lessons from PISA, but what this survey does and all of our studies, it gives people the possibility, you know, who would have looked towards Finland <coughs> before PISA? No? That wasn't on our radar screen. Who would have looked to China or, or, or Singapore? It wasn't on our radar screen what PISA has done. It has gives us the, the, the eyes and ears to see how the world is coming out in different aspects. What are the relative strengths and weaknesses? I believe that it's a good thing when you know policymakers learn something from that, or educators or researchers. You know, the biggest capital that PISA has created is the networks of experts, of researchers all around the world that meet, you know, almost on a continual basis to study, you know. How do you do how how do you design your curriculum? What are you teaching? How do you teach the kind of pedagogical practice? The Talis survey grew out of this. And the people <laughs> saw, oh, teaching looks very different across countries. Let's do a survey around this. Now we understand it more systematically. And the next thing we are currently working on a video library. Now we want to actually observe teaching practices around the world, make those practices you know, amenable so that actually you in Denmark can see how a teacher in, in another country teaches the same kind of subject differently. That's really the role of international comparisons. In a nutshell, PISA doesn't tell anybody what to do. What it does, it tells you what everybody else is doing. Thank you. And we have a question in the middle. Thank you. My name is Soren Honskov. I'm from the University College Copenhagen. Uh, thank you for a very uh, interesting presentation with a lot of food for thought. I think a lot of things to dig into. Uh, my question goes to a little bit to this discussion, actually. Uh, the whole premise of learning from these uh, uh, stats, right? I mean, uh, because what concerns me is that um, we have a what we could call a development or knowledge gap between policy makers and leaders on top levels and then, I mean, teachers and leaders on local levels, right? Um, and I wonder if, if you uh, have studied what makes teachers or what make uh, professionals want to learn from international comparison. Um, because what strikes me, if you have this, like, completely global perspective on things. You look at China, you look at Singapore, and you go, we can learn from these countries, right? And that might be true, but what would make teachers in like the outskirts of Copenhagen want to do that? And my idea, my, my thought would be that they would want to learn from countries that they can identify with, right? Or some, that they find some mutual ground and that may, maybe they want to look up to or value in some sense, right? So, but I guess this is, I'm, I'm broaching the subjects of the afternoon, I think. But just to, as a question, right? Did you study, I mean, do, do you have any surveys that actually cast some light on the propensity of teachers and you know, uh, ground personnel to actually engage in international comparison? Thank you. A very good question. And actually, we did a study on that where we looked at the impact of the work at different levels. We looked at, at researchers, at uh, scientists, as educators, teachers, school leaders, and system leaders. And uh, we learn a lot from this, in fact. And, um, but there are also some, some national case studies, you know. Yeah, clearly our intention is always to learn from people who share some commonality with us and to build kind of communities of practices around us. But sometimes, you know, looking at totally different practice can also be very instructive. I give you an example. In uh, 2012, the British uh, Minister of Education, Elizabeth Truss, went to Shanghai because they were at that time so doing so well in math. So she was a former math teacher, she, went, she visited many schools and then she found it really interesting and then she thought, you know, I'm going to invite 50 teachers uh, to come to England to actually give some demonstration lessons. And when she announced that, you know, everybody said this woman has gone completely crazy, you know. Uh, what can we learn from people from the moon who are so different from us and do everything so differently? There was a lot of skepticism, sarcasm, everything. 
What I can tell you is that this has become the biggest success story in the country. Now, many years afterwards, they have 30 mathematics hubs in the country where actually there are regular exchanges between teachers and they actually you know, learn from people who are very different from them. And I think those kinds of opportunities, we have far too little. We do have good collaboration in the research community. I think researchers are quite well connected in education. We have sort of some collaboration at the level of policy, uh, but at the level of practitioners, I think it's still a very isolated profession, very different from other sectors. If you were, if you were to be working in you know, the medical sector as a practitioner, you'd have a good view of what happens around the world in different parts. In education, we still lack this at the level of practitioners, and that's where our video study is exactly aiming at. Now, what if we can distill the teaching practices in different countries, document it, make it amenable, and you as a teacher in Denmark can actually log on find out, you know, I'm teaching students with an immigrant background, how is this done in the countries that are very successful on this? So I think those resources are the ones that we need to create which go beyond the numbers and actually make those numbers amenable to our practice. Another area that I should also mention, more recently, because there was so much demand for it, we created something that we call PISA for schools where basically individual schools can analyze their strengths and weaknesses and see themselves in a global picture. And you'll be amazed. This is voluntary. Your schools have to do it. It's a lot of effort. There are thousands of schools around the world that actually have become really interested to see themselves in the picture, to relate to this, and so on. There are conferences every year where those schools come together. So I think these are examples where progressively those connections are built at the level of practice. But I agree, it's still the weakest weakest part. No. Thank you. And uh, Heidi up front here with uh, a, a last question before we uh, finish off this session. Okay. Hello, I'm Heidi. I uh, teach American students at a study abroad uh, organization here in Copenhagen. And it was fun that you mentioned how uh, Americans don't really care what goes on outside of the US because I've been teaching, I don't know how many cohorts of American college students. And when I ask, so who of you know PISA? None of them ever replies. I've had one professor from a super prestigious uh, college in the US who knew what PISA was about. <laughs> she also knew John Hattie, which is, they always never know who John Hattie is. So that's kind of interesting, just as a comment. Um, I mean, I want to say a trillion things, but of course I can't. Uh, I'm amazed about the complexity of PISA studies. I used to be a teacher myself, and the common, con uh, I think, perception among Danish teachers, I can of course only speak for myself, is that uh, we shouldn't believe in PISA because it's just numbers and it says nothing about the truth. And I just want to say that I'm amazed about seeing how complex it is and actually how many amazing things you can look into. And I think this is so interesting as research. Um, I have a few things here. Yeah, now I took notes and I forgot that I had to hold a, a microphone. Um, I have three things I, I'd like to ask. Um, one of them is, uh, have you done studies, of course you have, on teacher training's impact on student achievement? Uh, and what do you, can you tell something about it? Um, another thing is, well, I'm, I, it's actually two questions in one. If you were to give uh, Danish policymakers one or maybe a, a few advices, uh, what would that be? And I'm thinking like, what is it we super suck at? And what is it we're super amazing at that we should make sure to keep? Um, thanks. Yeah, the, the first question is easy to answer. Actually, we have a lot of studies and data on uh, teacher training and how it varies across countries. Some data on the impact it has. Uh, what might surprise you is that we didn't find much impact of the differences in the initial teacher training. There are very different philosophies that countries pursue. You, know, you put pedagogy first, you put the subject first, you sequence this, you make them in parallel. All of those things vary across countries, and we could not find that that is reflected really grossly in student results. What we did find makes a difference whether Teacher, initial teacher education is highly selective, you know, like you have you know, in Finland or others where actually it is hard to get into teacher training. You know, in, in, in Finland, when you don't make it to teacher school, you can still go to law school and economics and those kind of things. Now, uh, so I think that matters, the kind of selective, selectivity of the teaching profession. 
uh, but what we found matters most is actually what happens when teachers are in school. So the opportunities for continued professional development, the nature of continued professional development, whether professional development is collaborative. You, know, you could see uh, individual going to training courses has no relationship to either teacher self-efficacy nor PISA outcomes. Engaging in collaborative professional development in the school is one of the big driver of teacher self-efficacy, as you could see from the chart I presented. So I think actually, and, and often we do the reverse, and this brings me back to the industrial system of education. We think, you know, we prepare people once for their life, then we drop them in school, and everything is going to be fine. Now, I think the future is much more about, you know, getting people early into schools and then ensuring that they have enough opportunities to grow in their careers, to help other teachers succeed in their careers. And um, the one thing about initial training, I should mention uh, early clinical practice. That's one of the factors where we can see a difference. To what extent teachers have early exposure in their university training in school education, not just going somewhere for six weeks, but really being constantly engaged in educational practice. No? Again, uh, in Europe, uh, countries like Finland and the Netherlands are doing really well on that. It would be generally the practice in most Asian systems. But in, in Asia, the focus on continued professional development is on, of a very different caliber than what we see in, in Europe. Uh, in some of those countries, it's out of necessity. They don't have the luxury of you know, investing a lot in initial teacher preparation because they need just, the, the systems are growing at such a rapid pace that they basically have to just scramble to get good people and then they invest in those people, build interesting careers. You know, professional development typically only works when you also can offer a career where those kinds of things pay off. So it's a lot of things that we have learned about the nature in which teachers learn and its impact on, on, on education, less about you know, the kind of questions of how do you sequence learning in initial teacher training, so the continued professional development is uh, really important. Uh, when I look at the re results in Denmark, you, know, you can say, well, Denmark is doing okay on these international comparisons. It's uh, not doing, you know, particularly well, not doing particularly badly. Uh, what surprises me more is, you know, the, the strong emphasis the country plays on equity ensuring equality and opportunity, which is not matched by the results. Now, I can't say that you know, the influence of social background outcomes is dramatic, but it's certainly much larger than what you know, the aspiration of the system is. And I think there are easy answers to this. Uh, it's about matching resources. You, I showed you some data, you know, matching the quality of teachers with the kind of challenges that uh, students face, and making it not just uh, so that's one thing I think I would, you know, think if you think about the future of society, you know, I'm a lot less worried about the future of work. You know, maybe robots will do a lot of things that we do now. I think the future of society is going to be the much, much bigger question. Now, will we have the level of, you know, cohesion and, uh, in our societies? And that's what happens in school. There's actually very little that you can do later in people's lives. You know, all the kind of lifelong learning talk uh, it tends to reinforce what we have done in schooling. You know, the people who've got a great education are going to continue to learn, and the people who've got a poor education are very unlikely to engage in professional development. So I think getting those foundations right for all children is, and it's a, as I try to show you, it's a realistic goal. It's something that we can actually do. Uh, so that's one thing. The second part is, you know, think about the work organization, how you create much more of a profession you know, that is engaged in, you know, continuous, you know, redevelopment of the ed education and instructional system at the front line. I think that's a challenge which you share probably with many countries, but I do think you have the tools and resources to do better on that, you know, creating more. In a way, it's about not just making teaching financially attractive, but making teaching intellectually attractive. Now, that, I think, is something I would really uh, prioritize to ensure that you will continue to get you know, a good you know, supply of really talented people in the future. Uh, thank you, uh, and uh, thank you all for putting these uh, 
relevant and interesting questions, making my questions uh, uh, more or less irrelevant. Uh, even though I'd like to finish off by uh, sharing a challenge that I have felt deeply uh, throughout my years in working together with the OECD and working together with Andreas. Uh, we started off in 1996, and by then uh, OECD had no education directorate. And uh, OECD was uh, by large considered as be some kind of a tool for development of uh, capitalist economy and uh, uh, the uh, education approach was related to a very simplistic human capital theory. Uh, and then up till now we have seen significant changes. Uh, today uh, the education directors is probably one of the largest units uh, in, 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 in the OECD and uh, has played in the role in the development of the organization as such and recently, uh, OECD has uh, developed a new growth narrative mm -hmm. which is much broader and much more comprehensive in people's life, work-life balance, uh, the uh, appearance of the focus on social and emotional competences, the focus on pedagogy, all this has changed. But what I see when I go into uh, visiting my old colleagues at uh, schools and in professional communities, that the image of OECD has remained rather stable. So, so uh, we, we still have uh, a communication challenge and we have a challenge actually to, to uh, develop awareness of how OECD have changed its approach and how it can be used also by the professional communities, by the teachers, uh, in order to, uh, to, to uh, uh, make better policies for better lives, which are uh, the uh, new slogan for, for the OECD. So, uh, thank you very much everybody for this uh, morning. I believe it's a, it's a good start.